can almost instantly win you most team fights because people don't have the damage to deal with the tombstone. It's hard to kind of keep him down. I think we saw, uh, do you remember, honey, it was like D2CL offlane and dying by Ice Ice Ice. He got solo killed by the Queen of Pain, had almost no CS, but dominated every single fight. Was that pre nerf though? I th that game, I'm not entirely sure if it was pre the second, it was you know, pre -nerf, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or the ultimate got a, you know, like the, the change in terms of yeah. movement slow. I generally think Undying is for sure a strong hero. He's undervalued in in that aspect, but I feel like he's not. To me, he's personally not a hero to pick up in the first two and be like, is, is I'm hundred percent comfortable with yeah. picking it up in the first right. two. Sure. I think we still run into some issues with Undying, where it's it's kind of a hero that you can just dodge him if you're really scared of him in lane. Like it's kind of easy to just rotate around and kind of get away from him. And I think that's maybe why when he's been nerfed a little bit, he's maybe not so much of a first pick. It's more of, okay, this thing will really work. We know where the lanes are going to be. We know where we want to throw the undying. And I think that's, that's kind of the situation where you want to pick him up when it's not so easy just to run away from him. Yeah. And so we've got a pretty heavy push comp actually coming out of complexity. They first picked the Dragon Knight. And alongside the Enchantress and the Leshrac, they've got a lot of buffers in terms of being able to deal tower damage, and that seems to be kind of what they're going for right Ooh. now, is go safe and stable and try to end the game quickly. I I like the way that they set this up, right? Because the Dragonite, and then followed up by the Clockwork Rubik, that doesn't necessarily say push right away, it just yeah. means you can have some elements of push. But then they pick up the Enchantress, okay, a little bit more elements of push, but with the Leshrac last pick, it's like, oh, boom, that, that ties it all in. That's a push lineup. I also like the Enchantress picked up against the Gyrocopter. I mean, right. Pettis going through Magic Immunity, that's yeah. pretty good I versus Gyrocopter. I generally think Enchantress is, is very strong, mm -hmm. especially after a change with the Impetus, but... You see a bounty hunter coming into the first two picks. Mm. To me, I'm very afraid that Eng is going to have a rough time. Yeah. Because if bounty hunter sits on Eng, I mean, it's not as bad as, uh, as bad as Chen, because you just have that one creep and you can't just refresh, right? It's difficult to me, because it, it depends on how how confident or how comfortable you are playing against the bounty. If bounty yeah. is just on an Eng, it's going to be very hard to get experience. And you will always share experience. And we've seen in previous series, when you have this Chen up. Not too much edge bounty, but with Chen, Chen always struggled in these scenarios. And right. you pick it into, in, you know, like you, you picked Ench, he chose to pick Ench into a bounty hunter that you've seen already. I guess it's the comfortable way of playing. It's very common to, you know, like it's kind of like all the patch versions where you have this DK middle and then you just go for a push threat with an Ench, where Ench provides a lot of early pressure, especially right. now that you have a Lash Rock, right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty good, but. I'm I'm still a bit questioned on how how to execute that end when you face a bounty hunter. Exactly. All right, with that, guys, we're gonna leave you with our casters for this match. It's gonna be Blitz and Hani. Take it away, guys. So once again, the two best-looking guys are left on the panel by themselves. Wow. <laughs> I just sold out. Wow. All right, so we got uh, <laughs> we got complexity versus Mouse, and once again, I'm being play by play. So hopefully, this goes okay. And Pile I die. I mean, there's four heroes lined up, ready for him, and just outside the sentry vision, I think he kind of understands what's going on, and I think he's just trying to be disruptive. Like, he's blocked the big the big camp already, and he's just trying to slow down the enchanters as much as possible. It's very, very good there by Pi, in, in terms of how he moved around that sentry ward. He saw what's coming, and he did not move in there. I, I'd imagine if the sentry wall, uh, sentry wall was slightly placed downwards, because you, you already cover the choke, right? Yeah. So... It could have been a bit better sentry to me because this play was semi obvious to me. Yeah. It was a good sentry though, in the sense that he'll spot the rotations for him when he moves back and forth. And like, they probably didn't anticipate him getting that ward in that position without them seeing him first. Oh, very, very true, yeah. actually. Yeah, you will see the rotation towards mid lane and see whether or not DK is going to get pressured. Interesting. It's going to be Swindon Melon's middle lane on the Dragonite against the Invoker. I actually think that matchup. To me, it favors DK in the sense that DK usually does not have the greatest time in mid. But against an Invoker, I think Invoker cannot pressure a Dragonite that well. Yeah, and also, I think for the most matchups, actually, the Dragonite, the new change to the Breathe Fire doesn't really do much. For example, if you're playing against a Magnus, he's going to just Shockwave to farm anyways. Or if you're playing against a Storm or a Queen of Pain, like, they have Flash Farm mechanics. But a hero like Invoker doesn't really do much. Yeah, he suffers heavily from that. Yeah, exactly. So Pi is just kind of messing around with him right now, and I think Z's is just, or um, they're just trying to secure this, this courier right now, so that Pi can't just like come in and snipe it. 
and he's actually waiting so long for it right now and is he gonna go in no there's no way right uh, this would actually be insane actually, he's just trying to spot the ground between like he's inching forward so that the tower doesn't see him i'm just surprised that usually when you send the courier backwards right towards the tier two I would be already afraid that he's not standing between the two towers, right? Yeah. And he went for that, but then you stop at the tier two. And the Z freaks actually. Ah, quite so, so he saw he spotted out the rotation of the bounty since he attacked the enchantress there, and then he sends the courier back. Yeah, he doesn't actually know that the sentry's here. He's actually leading him in here right now, and he has no idea he's in the center of it right now. Pylai die gonna go down for a first blood again for the second time that we've seen today and Z-Freak, he played that so well. He, he did didn't just indeed. attack him immediately, he waited for him to get in the center, so Pylai die had almost no time to react. And this is a really important first blood here for Enchantress. You 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 ensure your boots, right? So you can always like especially a bounty hunter that does not have boots, right? He's gonna struggle to to have any chance in the forest against Ench. Bottom lane now. Oh, and Fly's actually getting quite low. Is Okay, and again, Pylai die, gives up the first blood, and then goes to the off lane and manages to pick up a kill. So, twice, I mean, do you feel like this is an okay trade for them, though? I, they did give up the first blood, and they, it wasn't like they got the Leshra carry, right? Like, they just got to support Rubik? I mean, it's not great, for sure. And I think, in this kind of scenario, it really benefits the, the Enchantress to get a first blood. Yeah. To me, just because you, you ensure your boots. And you're going to deal with a bounty hunter a lot easier. Plus, on top of that, you could get a dust as well. So it's, it's very good for him. Same time as I wonder why they went so aggressive on the bottom lane. I mean, sure, you were not expecting a bounty, but at the same time, you know he just died. And the first thing that a bounty hunter is going to do, he's not going to go top lane to try to harass there. He's going to go back into your, uh, the opponent jungle and just try to get more experience from the enchantress. Yeah, I think the problem, though, is that Fly probably felt a little bit frustrated at being... In some sense, he zoned out because... A Rubik isn't the best damage dealing support, and he doesn't zone out of here like in dying very well, right? Because yeah. you don't really pressure very heavily, and so it looked like he just wanted to get aggressive there. But even if the Leshrac hits the stun, I feel like there's almost no way that they're going to put real pressure on Bulba. Yeah, I, I don't think, I agree, and I don't think they would have killed him. And now you're already on a scenario where the the safe lane Leshrac as your carry is is sort of zoned out of this lane. Yeah, and it's so important for him to have a good start because he needs to pick up the early point booster to get HP. It's just a farm dependent carry, I feel. Like you you need to have a good start on this. Are they actually, actually committing for this kill? Yeah, and they're actually nice. one more hit. Oh, and they actually managed to pick up the kill on Aziz as the Leshrac goes down and this is like the most classic pilot die game I've ever seen, but they might be able to get a rebuttal as he actually, way too actually hexes the troll, but they are able to get the net off. One more right click will do it and flies in position for that kill. A good job by complexity. Already a lot of action happening in this game. I, to me, I mean, Leshrac, the, the problem with leaving Leshrac this early, especially when you know a bounty hunter is sticking around, is even a smoke rotation towards top lane, which they were planning to do, right? Sure, they got a counter kill, but Leshrac, I, I don't know, it feels like to me it's one of those heroes, you are not the greatest late gamer, you're okay, but y being left alone, you s you, you're going to struggle mid game. If he doesn't get his early start, it's going to be hard for them to execute on early pushes. You have a cross vex in Volker middle, who's already going to stop or just, you know, going to be such a disturbance in, in terms of pushing. And oh. then initiation on end. And Pylai die, he actually gets the hit off and Z-Freak pops the heal and... Koikva is going to go for the kill on Fly. Meanwhile, while this is happening, and they're able to actually pick up both of those, and their jungle is completely cleared out. Just not a quick enough rotation by Complexity to get out of there. I felt like that was a little bit of a greedy move, especially with that ward being up, right? They put down the sentry. They weren't able to get the D ward. And once that happens, I, you have to kind of assume that there's vision up there. I guess with that sentry ward down, right, they just felt they would be safe in that area, thinking there would be no observer ward. And in that sense, you could you could assume, you know, like it's a play, it's kind of a safe play because you think, all right, I, at least I sentry yeah. and I did not stay in this area for a long time, knowing there's potential vision. So it's unlucky to not hit that sentry ward. Uh, I mean, that observer ward on the side of mouse. But yes, what do you accomplish just farming that area? It's it's not that safe. Period. Yeah, and pile I die. This is like the weirdest thing because in both the games I've seen him play the bounty hunter so far. He gives up the first blood, he gets the rebuttal kill, and then he just creates space everywhere on the map, despite the fact that he's died. It doesn't seem to phase him at all. It feels like he's just kind of okay with the fact that he's dying. He's like, alright, that's meant to happen. And Bulba tries to lift him onto the high ground. The tombstone is dropped as well. Fly's getting quite low. 
the heal by Z Freak is going off, but one more hit will do it by Boba, but he might actually be given up as well, and the left track is able to get the last hit, but quick, Black's actually going to come in from the back, Tornado and EMP land, one more right click should do it, and again, we just see rebuttal kill after rebuttal kill from Mouse. I was going to say it, actually, to me it wasn't paying off there by uh, for Mouse. Getting that kill onto a support and then in 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 trade of get, uh, dying on the undying, where Boba, I, I I was at first skeptical with that rotation, but then great great move by Black m coming in and ensuring a second kill that m made the whole trade worth it. Yeah, because again, like we talked about, with a hero like Leshrac, you need a good start. You need to be able to pick up some HP items early, because. If you're going to be in the front line, especially with this kind of build, I feel like you need a lot of health. Against yep. an Undying, an Invoker with 600 HP, if you caught out by the Tornado EMP, that's almost three-fourths your health with like one Undying zombie hitting you. And so he has to be a little bit more careful about this. And even though the score line reads three to six, I actually feel like it's even bigger than that is because of the fact that Leshrac hasn't had space to farm so far. He, he literally hadn't. He had no, not, not a good time at all. I mean, sure, he got a kill there, but he died eventually, right? And the, the, the big question right now is, did Clock get anything out of this whole rotation? You have a Clock that's level 5, who essentially he has to make something happen on level 6. He needs to set up ganks on an invoker, but it, it's, it's not going to be the easiest. You have EMP Tornado, which will always stop you in terms of just, you know, like, initiating on anyone. Like, especially coming, like, you want to stop the invoker mid lane, it's, it's going to be tough, right? You want to push, it's going to be very tough because the rotation can just stop it. One invoker rotation is going to stop pushing and then essentially that's going to stop the entire strategy here by complexity. You wanted to push early, but the core of, of complexity right now is non-existent. And I feel like that's kind of the strength of the Undying is the MP Tornado does go down and drains all of the mana of uh, Swindle right now, but I feel like that's kind of the issue with giving up a hero like Undying because the hero can pressure your carry so easily and if you have something like Leshrac, we which might, only has like 500 HP We might see a great rotation now by complexity on towards the mid lane Yeah, and they need this to work as well, like we talked about, you need a rotation on black and is this going to be spotted as Bulba actually moves over as well and now they're kind of put into an awkward position where they're on top of the hill not a whole lot of ways to get out and Z Freak immediately starts the TP they know that fly is down there but not in the best position to get him either and actually the TP comes in from the lion way two's coming in the tombstone is dropped misses the stun does connect with his own and Black's actually coming out from the side as well looks like he just wants to get this quick kill and go for the Leshrac again and that would be the worst thing for in the world for Z's but he's actually able to walk out of there but still Again, their gank rotation was caught out, and the double support that's supposed to stick together was able to get caught out in, in middle. Swindle gets hit by both, and do they have the damage for this? He's actually dropping quite low. The cold snap goes off as well. Zefri coming in from the south with the heal, unable to do anything. The undying TP as well, kind of canceling out the rotations from complexity, and again, it just feels like Mouse is kind of outmaneuvering them right now. Very true. I felt like that Swindle Mounds could have survived that actually. Top lane. Top. Koifa, he's going to get gone on as well. The stun's going to connect with him as well. Moon Meander is able to pick up the last hit. And finally, we see some good rotations. I feel it's very... That was fine. Yeah, it was It was very needed to stay into this game. It was, it's very important oh, and here. mid. Fly's going to get gone out as well. He's completely out of mana. One more right click should be able to do it. He does have the Shuriken Toss as well. That'll be the last hit. And that's a Bounty Hunter track kill as well. Swindle Melons is going to come in. Do they have the detection for him? Oh, and Moon uh, Pylite Dies actually just messing around with them right now. This is ultimate space creation as he's being able to drag them all the way to the south. Swindle isn't able to get the stun off him, him as well as the dust fades off. And I mean, Pylite Dies just... This is the kind of stuff that you rage at, right? Where you're just like, whoa, what are we supposed to do right now? Space creation is indeed. <laughs> and... I'm already l looking at complexity here. Like you would think, coming into the series, it would be very close. But I feel like Mouse is, is playing superior right now. They they're getting their um, rotations going. They shut down essentially pretty much three lanes. They won all three lanes. You have an Undying that had a really good time because of Pilot Eye here, right? Mid lane now. It's just gonna be a harassment. But it doesn't actually connect with the EMP there. Oh, and at bottom though, Bulba does have a haste rune. Way two's there as well with the hex. The stun follows as well. Moon Meander is pretty tanky though. He does have the stick up as well, but he actually uses the hookshot, lands into some zombies, is stuck into the cogs right now, and 
trapped between him and a lot of zombies, and uh, Pylite Die actually comes in with the track as well, and Wait, who's able to get out with just a sliver of HP, and that's another track kill going the way of Mao's with Pylite Die getting the last hit, and now he's on a mega kill spree. Oh no, and another, I felt like another misplay there by the Lesh Rock. If he actually moved closer for just one second, he would have had the extra, extra hit of the ultimate coming onto the line. Uh, yeah, it was the line there, and he yeah. would have ensured the kill. It's, it's very crucial to get these kind of kills, especially when you're this far behind. You just can't, it, it, this kind of stuff just can't happen. Yeah, and Seafreak's actually tracked up, and so his movements are going to be pretty limited, and... I just kind of feel that this bounty hunter pick is just doing so much right now for Mouse, and it feels like he doesn't care whether or not he gives up kills, as long as the a focus is on him. Like as long as you're not focusing on Quickfire Black, and you're just trying to sh sh shut down a four position bounty hunter, I I think that Mouse takes his trade every single time. True. Um, and going back to that, like you have an enchantress. I think not only bounty hunter is very good against against the jungler, right? But he also ensures that because you know someone is always in the jungle, that you're semi-safe on other lanes. Like when you rotate onto those lanes, a jungler can't just help out. D such as if you would have had two stable supports, right? And you would not have enchantress, then ganking with a bounty hunter essentially becomes a lot harder because you either face a tri-lane and you can't rotate onto that lane, or you have dual lane scenarios where a bounty hunter also has a hard time at getting any kills or anything done, right? And then he's just going to be a leeching, pretty much a leeching creep in the early phase of the game because there's no rotations that he can actually do. Yeah, and Z can fly again. They're paired up, but Koifa has actually entered this fray and he launches the call down. This should be a double kill, and it is with Way2 throwing down the finger. Kill after kill right now. And I mean, it just feels like they're being outmaneuvered every single time that Fly and Z-Freak go for a combination kill, like they go for the smoke. It's been spotted out, and the track flies on the Moon Meander, and that's just more vision going the way of Mal's right now. Is 4-12 to 12 in favor of Mal's, but the hook comes out from Moon Meander blind, but he misses the cogs, and Pilai Dai is just going to walk out of there, and that could have potentially been a pretty big kill for Moon Meanders. That would have been a streak, and I hear the tornado and the EMP going off, and that does catch out Swindle Melons. He is getting quite low, no mana whatsoever to speak of. The troll actually comes in, and the turnaround kill isn't going to be able to be possible, but Black is so farmed, and the three-man Ravage stun from Way2 lands as well. And Meanwhile, at the bottom lane, Koikva is able to take down that Tier 1 tower, and there's just too many zombies for them to contend with right now. In this scenario, I was actually, one question I had earlier was, um, if you're the Undying, would you, the, the, the way Boba's skilled, he skilled his ultimate very late. He goes two levels in Sorup. Uh, I personally disagree with not skilling the ultimate when you hit the level six, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a fan of the slow, and generally like the extra damage that you provide for anyone that joins you. But, I mean, I guess two levels in Sorup with having 10 potential creeps to deal damage, right? is maybe the better option. I'm not sure. I, I personally would prefer just getting the ultimate as early as possible. Yeah, and at this bottom lane, way too connects with the sun again. The call down is going to be the follow up as well, and Z's is going to go down once again. It's Quakefa. Good rotation by way too, and he's just picking up so much farm right now, and I believe he's also stacking Ancients with a troll. If I saw that correctly, yes, he is, and that's just going to add to his net worth and add top lane and a middle. Just kind of a harassment tornado He's EMP, and tower. at this top lane right now, there are mass pings going off, and Moon Meander is caught off on, in the south area, and Pylai die though, he's dripping quite low, and they're able to pick off that kill, and this should be in the tower as well if there are no rotations from the side of Mal's, and it looks like they're actually just going to trade a tier 2 for a tier 1 right now at 15 minutes in the game. Not an optimal trade at all, but at this point, when you're, when you're this far behind, I think you're happy with getting that kill and a tower yourself. Yeah. Something I want to know as well is, when you're behind like this and your rotations don't work out, what do you sort of tell your team or yourself to kind of keep yourself in it? Like, if you're in this type of scenario, how do you convince yourself and your team that there are still ways to win? I think my number one, my, my number one concern always, like, in, in these kind of scenarios is you need to stick together. Like, trying to, you know, split up and farm often doesn't solve the problem. So you either use smoke rotations together and get something done, or you just like, 
you know you take a, the least risk possible because the only way they're gonna extend to a lead is getting pickoffs, right? Yeah. You get a pickoff, and what often hap happens, especially if you're in a lead, like let's say a bounty hunter, a bounty hunter, he would rotate alone, trying to search for kills. And if you know that you're three in an area, of course your farm is limited. But getting those pickoffs often means that you get another, let's say, 30 seconds of room where you know you face a 4v5. So potentially you get more space from that. And I just feel like that's that's the way to not fall back, essentially. Yeah. It feels like, though, in some ways that Mal's are kind of happy with what's going on. When Pylite die, dies, as weird as it sounds, because so much of the focus is on him. He's often the only player revealing himself on the map when he goes around trying to just track people, defend towers by himself. It feels like his role this game is just to paint a giant target on his back. Do you oblige there? Do you just go for him directly and try to keep him down as much as possible? Because it feels like that kind of plays into their hands. Mm, I mean, obviously you... Oh, and actually, a big call down is going to come down. Moon Meander is going to get instantly bro blown up, and the Undying Zombies are chasing as well. Z is trying to get out of there, and Z Freak should be okay as well. The track does connect, though, on Fly, and the Tornado follow-up as well. Their entire team is there. That's going to be a four-man track bounty kill, and up at top, Koikva... Gonna push this lane out, and it looks like they want to go for this tier 1 tower and kind of just have a show of force right now. To me, I personally always get so paranoid when I see track kills happen. I'm like, ah, this is not just one kill, this essentially means like two two kills. It happens twice, and, and I already feel like, oh my god, there's gonna be another item, right? There's gonna be a BKB soon or whatnot. So, literally, like, I'm panicky. I'm a, I'm a bit panicky personally when, when this kind of stuff happens, but... I essentially, that's the key factor to Bounty Hunter, right? Like, if you snowball just for a short moment, y you might lose the game just from that. So it, it and if they see the Bounty Hunter here, oh, and they actually get the uh, hook off on him as well, and Pilot is going to go down, and this is what we talked about. He's often going to go by himself, and they have to punish this more often. Like, the fact that he was able to get five kills in succession that early on just kind of led to this kind of scenario that they're in right now, and so... Uh, a really good kill by them, though, being able to spot that out. I think they saw the animation, right, of the yeah. smoke as the Windwalk faded, and good reactions by them. And Bulba's picked up Arcane Boots with a mech. It's actually quite farmed right now, and it looks like Mao's... So far, they've been playing the waiting game, but they look like they just want to take out all the Tier 1 towers. I just... I mean, now they're attempting to go for that mid-push. They have two creeps there with a Dragonite who has his ultimate up. I just think it's just not happening. To, to be honest, Tornado EMP, in a, in a scenario where you're behind, you, you will never get that push going. It's, it's literally impossible. I feel like you need to get a pick-off on the Invoker or another core, most likely Gyrocopter, to attempt a push. Yeah, and Black actually, we're seeing this stat pop up right now. Do you feel like he got the four staff before the Hanamitis just because of the clockwork and he's like, okay, the first rotation is really key. If I'm able to just kind of force out of there, I can keep snowballing as well. Mm, I, th I mean, it's just, it's, it's a safe, it's a safe play, pretty much. When you see the level of clockwork and he had a, he had a decent game, right? Yeah. Then I would say it's, it's not a b bad move at all uh, to get that four step before. Um, to me, another question is, you know, what often happens when you decide to go for a four step, your follow-up item is not a Midas. Oh, and in middle, Koikva's there as well with the stun rocket coming in and he should lay down the call down as well. No, not quite yet. Bulba with the tombstone. He's able to come in from the back line, but this looks like a fight that isn't really going to go anywhere as Cole is able to hold without losing any casualties. Complexity is not stacking the ancients here, are they? Oh, they, they are they have stacking. It twice. Okay. That's because it's, to me, it's one of those um, mechanisms against or for a Dragon Knight that hits level 2 ultimate to, you know, like, sustain your farm. Because he's not one of those flashy heroes that can just farm fast. And stacking Ancients is one way to stay in the game for him. And I think it's it's very important that they stick to doing that. Yeah, I guess the problem for them and the main reason why they're not doing it is just because they're devoting so much time to kind of uh, clearing out their own jungle. And so in this middle lane, this should be the big fight. There's way two steps forward with the stun. The call down's gonna connect as well. In the middle of all of this is Koikva with this BKB and Swindle Melons is gonna go down as well. And the damage is just too strong by Koikva and another track kill is gonna come the way of Z Freak. They should be able to catch up to this as well. One hit should be able to slow him down just enough. The stun connects as well and Z Freak's gonna go down and that decay on that Enchantress <laughs> evaporates her HP and 
again, another track kill coming the way of uh, Mao's as they are able to get a four-man, no, that was a three-man kill, but with multiple tracks, I believe. Yeah, it's it's just. Oh, it was a four man. It was a four man. It's just thanks, Ropas. I think it was, I think it was actually <laughs> two track kills there, on the side of yeah. Faust. And given the fact, you know, often, d like, like put it this way, right? You start to fight, and even if you would, you would end up going two v four, right? Like two death on the side of complexity, or four death on the side of complexity, and two death on on the side of mouth. In in this scenario, when no one dies and everyone surrounds the target of track, it's just. It, it just exp exponentially makes this track kill so much more worth it. Yeah, and both the combined net worth of the Dragon Knight and the Lesh track pretty much the same as the Gyrocopter right yeah. now. And Boba actually picks up this medallion. I'm assuming this is almost just entirely for the Roshan because they don't have the best way to Roshan. Uh, but I think at this point, with the type of lead that they have, if they want to go high ground, they have to take this Roche to absolutely secure it. And I think this is a fine pickup. No, I agree, especially be just because... Um, you have an upgrade to the medallion, so it essentially is not bad at all. Yeah, the solar. B nobody's gonna get an MKB anytime soon on complexity. Yeah. And just because you have the upgrade, getting evasion on, on an undying like just period is is fine, right? With a with a buff with a solar crest that you can apply to yourself, but uh, it just makes to me it makes the item more worthwhile. Minus ten armor is also quite insane. So yeah. if you get it on a target. Such as an Enchantress, Lishrak, <laughs> as I would even say as well as a Dragon Knight, who is sure he sits at quite a lot of armor, but you negate a chunk of it. Yeah, and that's actually a really big deal right now, because if we think about how Undying is going to work, is he's going to hit that Decay on heroes like the Lishrak and the Enchantress or the Rubik, that would take out a fifth of their HP, and then you've got the Solar Crest on top of that, negative down armor. They're actually just going to get one shot, and they find Fly in the jungle. He's going to go down as well. That's another track kill at the last second. Tornado is going to connect on the Dragon Knight as well. No TP now for Swindle Melons. This should be another track kill. Moon Meander still there. Is trying to just get his teammate out of there in black. Walking around, and Moon actually manages to get the hook shot off, and he's actually doing the... This is the, you know, the <laughs> sacrificial Titanic song moment as Swindle Melons goes the other way, but he actually gets a stun off under the line before he's able to get the hex or the stun, and he actually follows up. Swindle is going to get caught out here, and if this is a kill as well, the fact that Moon Meander came back to be able to get this, and Way2 still has his finger of death as well, it's going to fly. There goes another track kill, a four-man one at that as Bulba walks in just for the experience in the track kill, and Mal's... Being able to pick both of those off, a 924 gold change over two heroes. And another bad exchange there overall. I just feel like... Oh, and the Leshrac actually commits suicide because I think, yeah, Koiko was in position, not a whole lot of ways to come out, and he's actually picked up an MKB fully completed at 23 minutes. of the BKB. Yeah, he is very far ahead here. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention is just the fact, I felt like l in this game, Fly was out of position too many times too. Oh, and at to top, see. once again, like you mentioned, out of position as Pylai die and Way2 able to pick that up and these just try to, these add up so quickly. Yeah, exactly. Like, once you have track, I mean, if you die before track, it's like, it's not great, right? But it, it's it's not that costly. But potentially, any hero, even if he has like, now you can see the Rubik at 1,800 net worth, right? It, if he, if you get a track on him, it's just <laughs> as good as getting a hero that has double, triple that net worth. It's, it's essentially so much gold that you give away. And then often it's not just a bounty hunter that benefits from it. It's, it's usually two to three heroes. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, because I was kind of wondering, is it even worth it to keep killing this Rubik? But with the track, every single time you go for it, right? Because it just pumps up and inflates the net worth of heroes like the Lion and... Z Freak's actually going to get caught out in the jungle. This should just be an intimidation play by Pylai Die, but Black's actually coming in from the rear. Isn't able to do anything. Just a little bit too much HP and a little bit too close to the tower, but still more space creation as everybody just continues to farm. And at top, it looks like they want to collapse on this top lane. And Quakefa's healed to full. He does have the Aegis as well. And the, he heroes, and the heroes on the side of, of Maul are tower. just absurdly farmed. The amount of gold that they got throughout these uh, these skirmishes is just insane. It, it almost looks like I think it was the secret against the uh, Vici game, yeah. where Vici managed to get five heroes on top <laughs> of the, the the entire roster of uh, secret, which pretty much almost happens here as well. Like it, it won't take much longer if there's going to be another 
another skirmish where it ends up being a 4 to 0 fight, just the track alone is gonna give them that edge. Because usually, if you're this far behind, you don't get that much gold. You don't. But yeah. just because of yeah, because of this, they use this bounty hunter to f to a full extent. Yeah, and he's actually picked up a four staff for himself. And something to note that's really important is he was doing this all with level one track. Like things don't get better now as he picks up the second level of track. And we actually saw a really core item pick up on Koikva as well, or uh, Black, as he picks up his hex. And this is actually going to mean so much. The fact that I don't think anybody has a BKB on complexity. The Dragon Knight might, but I don't really know where he would get a, the farm for it. The less track looks like he's going in that direction, and so this Hex is just going to pay off so hard. As he actually walked in the jungle and Moon Meander throws out the hook. Looks like he just wanted to get out of there. And complexity right now, they're just being zoned out of their own jungle. As they don't really have a lot of wiggle room. Was it a hook shot out? Of it, just a track? I think he thought that his jungle was being invaded and they uh, don't really have the best vision there as well, so I think he was just trying to get out the best way he could. I guess, I mean, I guess Hookshot doesn't have the greatest cooldown. It just shows how how scared they are at this point, right? Oh, and middle lane right now is Swindle Melons is initiated on, but that shouldn't mean too much. Is There's not a whole lot of follow up. I think that's just one of those annoying moves, right? He's just trying to bother him as much as he can. The problem just with the Dragonite is, when he loses all his mana, using the ultimate plus a stun, like, that's the, the least you want to do, right? Using yeah. your ultimate alone doesn't do anything. And it takes him more than two bottle charges to do that. So, essentially, he's quite, he's like, qu qu okay, he, he alright, my friends. <laughs> he only <laughs> needs two bottle charges to do that. <laughs> but, essentially, it, it takes him off, right? You, you, you're just, uh, you're like, you're just this... You use your ultimate, you want to initiate, and you can't do that. So using all your bottle charges, if this happens one more time on the initiation, he can't do anything. Like, he's just going to sit there. And it just shows again how how the heroes on the side of Mouse just work very well against that lineup. You, I just feel like the struggle here I just see is this, the edge pickup to me doesn't, is not justified in this kind of match. Yeah, and the initiation is going to come too as the tier 2 fa tower falls and all of Mal's right now are collapsing on top of Swindle Melons. You're not tanky enough for that one and they should be going high ground with this as well. No, they actually just kind of circle around. It looks like they want to wait for this next Roshan to absolutely secure the game, but the net worth just continues to climb for Mal's as four hero track kills over and over again. That's not the type of position you want to be in and things just get from bad to worse as so much harm on the way of Mal's. And the funny part is that a single bounty hunter at this point pretty much shows their entire movement. Because they can't move out alone at all. So once he gets one track off, he, he essentially knows where everyone is. Yeah, and he actually... It's like you said, you have to kind of stick together at this point if you're being picked off like that. But if you're getting one hero tracks off, it just kind of snowballs in the sense of like... How do you really come back if one hero is tracked at all times? Because that's all Pilot Die is looking for. Is he's just looking to track one person and not let you smoke or move around this group. Yeah, th that's very true. And uh, I mean, I don't obviously going into this tech qualifier, you you don't want to give up anything, right? But I feel like at the same time, it's the first game. You might want to shake it off. I just feel like coming back in this game, it almost seems impossible to me. Like from my point of view. I mean, you can try to make another smoke attempt and, you know, like, come back, but essentially if you give up the next Roshan, I don't see a comeback in this scenario. Yeah, the ability for them to be able to kill the Gyrocopter twice would actually be quite difficult, but I still want to see if Complexity can do it. And yeah, it's, I mean, of course, it's, <laughs> in the end it's the TI qualifier, so you don't want to, you don't want to give up games for sure. Yeah, and Z-Freak's going to get initiated on top. They don't have detection from quite yet as... Uh, Quickfa's actually just going to TP out of there, and Pilot Die does come in at the last second with that gem, but unable to pick up that kill, and not too bad. He's able to push out. He does have that Glimmer Cloak, so he's actually okay in that scenario, I being wonder, able to push out. I mean, when you use Glimmer Cape, and yeah. he attempts to TP, right? Um, with the attempt of that TP, I felt like they could have potentially, he could have still potentially gotten that MKB hit off. Yeah, and they try to go for that kill on bottom, just trying to get anything they can in middle again. Swindle Melons goes down as four heroes from uh, Mal's are completely ready for that, and maybe they don't even wait for the Aegis at this point. They have to feel the advantage they have at this point, right? Like, there's no doubt about it. The amount of farm that Koikva has alone, <laughs> him alone, is worth at least three heroes on complexity at this point.
I'm just like trying to think of what complexity could have done earlier in this kind of game. One thing I think that helps against a bounty hunter from my point of view is maybe going for a shadow blade route, and then you get, at least you can smoke gank, and then you know use the shadow blade at certain times when you know you're in the area where kills can happen and that way you can pop the smoke and get a kill like you get that pick off before the team fight starts essentially there's not going to be a track so no movement speed buff for the entire team i just i mean maybe he didn't get the he didn't have the chance to finish a, a big item like that early enough and it's snowball too early but to me it would have or could have been the right item choice for this kind of game yeah something i want to point out as well is that I guess I didn't really think about it before, but that invoker pick was so perfect because the only initiation they really have is the clockwork or a really slow moving Dragon Knight. So if the clockwork hooks in, all Black has to do is fire the tornado and the EMP in that general direction, and it'll stop any sort of initiation. And then from there, you get to choose how you want to take the fight. Definitely, no, I, I, I totally agree with that pickup. And the other thing is, you pick that edge, right? And you choose to pick the edge into a bounty hunter, so you already face you you kind of face one factor that makes your draft a lot weaker with having a jungler against a bounty hunter. But then, just like you mentioned, having the invoker on top against an an early push threat like this, you have to snowball to kind of secure momentum in this kind of draft. And if you don't manage to come ahead in the early game, there's hardly any coming back. Yeah, they're gonna go for this Roshan right now. And do you think this means high ground after this? Yeah. Especially after the, the last mouse series, the, the, pretty much the way they played is exactly like this. They get the ages, they go for high ground. They need one track, and if you if you look at uh, at Korgos damage at this point, one track essentially means no one can come close to him. <laughs> and so with the Flak Cannon as well, I mean, he just rips through the complexity lineup. Not a lot of heroes have too many items. I think Z-Freak, yeah, he's got that Glimmer Cape, but not much else. And He's actually going to get initiated on this black. Does get... Uh, he should be able to get... Uh, no, and he's actually able to get out, but still... I don't think it matters too much. That would have been a nice kill to lead, but he probably would have respawned in time as Moonmander is actually going to get caught out in this area, but he should be able to get out as well. And everybody from Complexity is able to make it out of this top lane. Moon even going as far as hooking out. It's funny to me when I look at Bounty Hunter's items, he still keeps that orb of Venom on him instead of a, like a TP or something like that. Sure, he has an Observer Ward, but you know, it's just these item slots when you have the ward. I'm like, like, at least in the mid late game, I would be like, do I really need that orb of Venom? Oh, oh and Swindle! No. The BKB is popped as and well. And see it. Yeah, they and see he actually rocket. goes on the low, low ground and that is the worst possible scenario for them because I feel like that 10 second BKB is the only chance you have. Like, he has to make so much happen with that. And with that BKB popped, I mean, Complexity have to play the perfect fight. But they're running into this kind of juggernaut of farm as at this top lane. They're just kind of pushing in all the lanes at once because they realize that uh, they can back them up fast enough as that tower is going to go down pretty rapidly. This Complexity is taking heavy damage in this mid lane as well as Koikva is kind of just here alone with the Aegis and the Butterfly. And... The amount of damage he's putting out is actually quite high, and they know the BKB's down, but I guess they just don't want to overextend. I mean, the only upside I see here from this side of um, complexity is that cl the gyrocopter actually going high ground is still has quite some trouble, just because he doesn't have enough HP to sustain, you know, like the, the two nuke waves that they have. If Rubik hits him with a nuke, Leshrock hits him with a nuke, then you have the Breathe Fire, he's just gonna drop quite low, so using the Gyrocopter Aegis effectively... Oh, oh my god. And he actually just gets tracked, and the Flat Cannon alone is able to get the kill on Z-Freak. I wasn't even prepared to commentate that, because I didn't expect that. And that's just the sign of things to come. And before the fight even happens, the GG is called. They realize what's going on. They're rushing right now at them as they do manage to pick up the kill on Koikva, but that's only the Aegis, and GG has already been called. And so game one boost to Maus, and man, that, that was about as dominant as a game that you're expecting from them. And at the beginning, though, things went pretty well, right? We saw the first kill come on from the Enchantress onto the Bounty Hunter and you thought to yourself, okay, that's a really good start for the Enchantress, but then things just kind of spiraled out of there. What do you feel like went wrong? I mean, it was the same mechanism, right? You have the you have Paladai, who dies, then he goes to a bottom lane and he gets a kill. Um, other than that, you can say, I just, I, to me, the, I guess the, the Invoker plus Bounty Hunter was too much 
like they struggle too hard in in terms of getting a push against them and one way is you stop either invoker from having a decent game and he had a great game he wasn't stopped what 